Louis Gave, good morning to you on this December 3rd. You're on Vancouver Island and we're in the cloudy London and Durham. It's an absolute joy to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, very, very happy to, to be here. Louis, what's going on? What's happening? <laughs> Well, it's like a Marvin Gaye song, but DD delisting and, you know, stocks delisting from U.S. market is, you know, um, PetroChina next. What are we having a polarization in capital movement and where is capital going? Yeah, um, I'm glad you narrowed it down because what's going on? <laughs> you know, I could have gone in any any one direction. Um, so yeah, once again, look, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for having me here. Um, no, look, I think we're, we're living, we've gone through 25 years of really, well, even, uh, so even before China joined the WTO, ever growing integration with China, ever, uh, uh, you know, economic integration, even cultural integration with, you know, thousands and thousands of students from China going to the Western world to study, whether at Durham University or in the United States or in Canada. Um, and um, I think on both sides, both in, in the Western world uh, and, in, um, and in China, um, there's a, a sort of uh, at least desire to take a pause and figure out whether this makes the most, uh, the most economic sense, um, the most cultural sense. Um, and it's, I think it's pretty clear at this stage that at least China and the United States, uh, Europe perhaps a lot less so, but at least with China and the United States, um, there is a parting of ways. Um, and so uh, to your point, when it comes to, to the world of capital allocation, um, I think the message coming out of China came up loud and clear with a DD Chuxing listing um, a few months ago that basically China was no longer comfortable uh, having its companies raise capital in the U.S. Uh, in essence, the message that, that China sent to the world was, look, uh, you're welcome to participate in our growth story um, and you're welcome to invest in China, but if you're going to do so, you're going to do so on our rules. Um, and so you're going to invest in Shanghai or you're going to invest in Hong Kong that we've basically now taken over. Um, and the world of capital spending will occur uh, on, on our rules. Um, and... Um, and at the same time, and this is because, partly because of course on the US side, there's also growing demands of uh, what Chinese companies have to do to, to, to gain access to, to US capital. So yeah, I think there's, there's growing discomfort on both sides and basically uh, hardening of positions on both sides. But are you seeing like this is going to go beyond the technology companies? I mean, do you see that PetroChinas of the world as well in a world of net zero and decarbonization as well will move um, towards Shanghai or Hong Kong? Is that something yes. that you... Yes, I think, um, you know, the reality is the days where, you know, this was always, I thought, to be honest, a, a bit of a quandary from the start, right? Why would a Chinese corporate raise capital in New York. Um, you know, China has a very high savings rate and a grow, growing domestic pool of savings. Um, at the same time, China, for a number of reasons that I'm very happy to go into, is very intent on growing its own domestic capital markets. Um, and in fact, it's almost a geostrategic imperative for them to grow their own, their own capital markets. And so it was always a bit of an anomaly that China's big national champions, whether you're, you know, you mentioned PetroChina, but you're Alibaba's or et cetera, um, would raise capital in the US. It's like, you know, why, why go halfway around the world to, to raise capital when really we should be doing it right here at home? Um, and um, so I think the, uh, the raising of capital in the US was sort of a, a band aid or, you know, to, to, or a bridge to get you to where you wanted to go. Um, and that bridge having served its purpose, it's no longer really needed. Uh, you know, why should PetroChina be listed in New York? Uh, why, why should Alibaba be listed in New York? You know, there's, there's no obvious logic to it. Uh, Louis, a couple of issues arise from what you're saying. The first is, so all the talk of a growing, integrating world in which China and, and, 
and United States have to converge. Um, are you suggesting that's now being unpicked more or less deliberately by both parties? So the first question is, where does that leave the international economic system if there is now this divergence? But also if you pull two chairs apart, there are a lot of people whose weight is on both of these chairs. They Where are they going to end up? Where are they going to end up? <laughs> With their ass on the floor. Uh, no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Um, look, I think you're, you're absolutely right. If, if we go back five, six years ago, the buzzword of the day was Chin America. You, you, you remember this, right? To basically talk of, of a world where in, increasingly the US and Chinese economic cycles were integrated, where elites of the countries were going from back back and forth. You know, Hank Polson felt like he was, you know, almost living in Beijing. He was spending so much time there. Um, and clearly we've moved moved uh, moved away from there. Um, for me, the you know the the big shift, the big catalyst moment was Huawei. Um, and here, you know, I know that today uh, in the Western world it's it's very easy. And it feels quite right to criticize Xi Jinping. You know, the view, the broad view in the Western world is, look, Xi Jinping is this power mad tyrant whose uh, only preoccupation is to, you know, crush any political dissent and, and you know, grab more power. Um, but, you know, I, I was taught that, you know, before you criticize someone, you, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. Uh, like this, at least, you know, once you criticize them, you're a mile away and you have their shoes. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that, so if we put ourselves in Xi Jinping's shoes and we ponder the question, what's been the most traumatic experience for Chinese policymakers in recent years, I would venture that it's not COVID uh, and it's not Evergrande, forget that, that's like nothing. Um, and the most traumatic experience by far has been the Huawei crackdown. Um, so again, put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes. Huawei was your industrial jewel. It was your pride and joy. It was the first time that China had really managed to build an international brand. And it was gaining market share at the very pinnacle of technology against Western companies. And then the US comes in and in the space of three months, destroys Huawei. Basically says, nobody's allowed to sell semiconductors to Huawei anymore. Huawei implodes. It would be akin, you know, I, I often tell this to, to my French clients. I say, imagine if the US government came in and said, you know what, Airbus is a threat to US national security. So nobody's allowed to sell semiconductors to Airbus and then Airbus implodes. You know, the, this would be deeply traumatic. Um, this is basically what happened. And, and the Chinese policymakers could do nothing about it. They basically had to sit back and, and take the pain. Um, and now you might say to me, well, you know, this is, this was Trump doing Trumpian things, and you know, then you know Trump leaves, so now we can hope that things get back to more normal footing. Um, however, you know, you know, while there's a lot of differences between the Biden White House and the Trump White House, um, when it comes to China, there's basically been no difference. Um, you know, there's still very much the feeling of antagonism. Toward, towards China emanating from the White House. I'll, I'll give you an example. Just two months ago, Gina Raimondo, the US Commerce Secretary, you know, in the middle of a press conference says that it's US policy to slow down China's rate of innovation growth. Uh, now, granted, this might be US policy, but I would think that's the bit you don't say out loud. You know, call me crazy, but to, to publicly say, look, it's our innovation, it's our, it's our it's our policy to, because when you say you slow down somebody's rate of innovation, in essence, you're saying we're slowing down that rate of growth. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you imagine if, you know, tomorrow the US came out and said, it's our policy to slow the UK rate of innovation? I mean, there'd, there'd be uproar uh, in, the, in the British tabloids and media. Um, so if you're Xi Jinping, this is the message you're getting from the US. And so you think, okay, the US is out to get me. And how do how I have to protect myself? Um, one of the ways I have to protect myself is make sure that I am not dependent on US capital markets to go, to go back to Ali's first question. Um, you know, I have to make sure I'm not dependent on US capital markets. I gotta grow my own capital markets. It becomes a geostrategic uh, imperative. Um, now to your point, uh, I think there are a lot of businesses, uh, even countries that are stuck in the middle. Uh, you know, think of Apple. 
Uh, Apple is the prime example. They produce most of their stuff in China. Um, China is basically a fifth of their sales. Um, you know, it's they don't want to be stuck in the middle. Now, so far, a lot of companies like Apple that have huge Chinese markets um, haven't felt the, a potential Chinese backlash because what's happening in China is the, um, China very much realizes that there's a lot of anti-China sentiment in Washington, D.C., and really the only friend they have are U.S. corporates. That's it. Like, uh, to be honest, that's so you don't want to piss off U.S. corporates and turn them against you uh, because they're the only guys lobbying in your favor in Washington. You know, today, the only guys saying, hey, let's not beat up on China too much are Apple, Walmart, uh, you know, General Motors. For those other guys who are saying, yeah, you know, let's let's take it easy on the China bashing because it is a lot of money for us. Um, so you, these are the only guys fighting your corner. So so far, you know, I don't think you know these guys have have suffered from from the the split. Um, the risk, of course, is that at some point, um, either the rift gets so bad that you know these guys have to choose option one, or option two, China feels, you know what, we don't need these guys lobbying for us anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're not there. So I think so far these guys are okay. Couple of questions. But, Go ahead, Anush. <laughs> sorry, but, but Louis, uh, when American government does this kind of public messaging, particularly to corporates, obviously, that, you know, who's, who are, who've continued to invest in, in, in Chinese companies, particularly those listed on American stocks change, of course, as well. So how are they to interpret this rising tension from their own government being advised that your money may not be safe or that you cannot put it in those particular corporations while the Chinese obviously want to get the maximum from the investments going into their corporations. So we're talking about many billions of dollars worth of current investments, but also potential investments across the water. How, how are they to respond to these tensions? Oh, I think it's a, it's a tough call. Um, it's a, it's a very, very tough call. Look, I think if you're, if you're Apple, um, you know, the way you respond and what they've been trying to do is to say, uh, you know, we need to pull away from China. Now, you know, we can't rip the bandaid and pull off all at once because, you know, logistically that's just not possible. Um, for a lot of companies, both in terms of production, in terms of what they produce in China, and also in terms of just the market and the size of the consumer market there for them, um, pulling away is simply not an option. So on the production side, I think you have seen big efforts to move production to Vietnam, to move production to India. Uh, you know, Apple's tried to, to boost production in India. Uh, you know, depending on where you are on the value chain, if, if you're doing things that are quite low on the value chain, then yeah, you know, if you're into textile, if you're Walmart, and you know, you can move producers to Bangladesh or to Vietnam, etc. But um, the big, there remains a logistical challenge because, you know, China's big selling point for the past two decades has been to offer the rest of the world first world infrastructure at third world prices. Um, you know, when, when you're Apple and you, you know, outsource the production of iPhones to Shenzhen, you know that the iPhones will be produced. You know there won't be any power cuts. You know there won't be uh, strikes of employees. You know, you, it's, it, it's going to go smoothly. Um, when you, when you outsource to, to Vietnam, when you outsource to India, uh, you have no such certainty. Uh, there might be power cuts. There might be all of a sudden supply chain dislocations, which means that you know, things don't move around as you would hope, and, or there might be strikes. Or, um, so uh, the, the problem is as you move elsewhere, more often than not, you get you know, third world infrastructure at third world prices, which is why you didn't go there in the first place. Um, so, um, you know, I think the, the efforts to, to move away means that um, the, the guys that probably benefit the most are actually the guys that aren't cheaper, that are perhaps more expensive, but that still offer good infrastructure. So think of the Polands of this world uh, or, the, uh, or the Mexicos of this world. Um, Dare I say South Korea even? Or even, even yeah, or even South Korea, exactly. Um, so um, so th that's on, on the production side. On the consumer side, uh, the reality is that if you're an Apple, if you're General Motors, if you're a Procter & Gamble, you simply can't turn away from the Chinese market. Uh, and that, of course, is the one card the Chinese government has to can play and does play um, uh, with all these big corporates is, look, 
you, you tow our line to a certain extent, because if you don't, we're going to shut you off this market, which is, you know, uh, the world's largest single market, uh, world very fast growing market. Um, and uh, again, you, you, you can't be a Volkswagen, a General Motors and say, you know what, I'm just not going to do China. You know, <laughs> forget it. It's, it's just, you know, your, your share price is going to have if you, if you say that. So um, that is the, 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 the one part. Now, when it comes to the, to the investments um, in the stock market uh, in New York, uh, to, to more directly go to your question, I think the message there, both from the SEC and from China has been pretty clear. And the message has basically been, look, over the next couple of years, this, this thing is done. And I think with Didi's recent announcement uh, last night, this is in fact going to accelerate from here. And what you're gonna see, what you're seeing in that space is when you look at you, Chinese companies listed in the US, they fall into one of two baskets. You have the behemoths, the guys that are, that are massive, and those can get relisted or, and have already often done so in Hong Kong or in Shanghai. So, uh, so you have, oh, I'm sorry about my dogs uh, in the background. Uh, it's always the same. It's always the same story. I get on a Zoom call, and if somebody rings the doorbell, and dogs go nuts. Um, uh, sorry. I think I think it's the quiet. most financially oriented dog out there, Louis. Listening <laughs> to you every day. The um, so sorry about this, but the um, uh, to answer your question, um, the um, um, I, th I think what's happening is you have the ones the really big companies that are going to relist in Hong Kong or in Shanghai. So if you own, let's say, Alibaba stock in New York, now you're gonna own it uh, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and then, you know, you had all these companies, sort of smaller companies, the guys that aren't in the billions, but are in the hundreds of millions of dollars in market cap that listed in the US because they didn't meet the criteria to list in Hong Kong or Shanghai. And those guys are gonna be orphans. Um, and they're going to get delisted, and it's not obvious where they're going to get relisted. So, you know, th those those stocks are are probably dangerous dangerous to own. Couple of questions, Louis. It's fascinating always listening to you. Uh, for me, among all the analysts, you're like one of the best cut tuna sushis with a lot of was wasabi. You know, the the the, 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 the soberity in your comments are always refreshing, and I want more. I want to go back to Huawei and I want to have your opinion. Many people think it's very hypocritical of US, for instance, in you know, um, pointing fingers at Huawei because Microsoft, Amazon, they're all in you know, defense contracts with Jedi and the rest of it. So from the Chinese point of view, they may say, well, wait a minute, if the big corporations are not to be involved in you know, certain sectors and dual use, then your prime, you know, Behemoths are in there, and that's one. The other thing, I would love to have your thoughts there. The second question, and that is about, you know, this capital flow. Some analysts, uh, Louis, these days are saying there's so much of holding in large positions in renminbi denominated securities. And because of this foreign ownership, now we can influence China's policy. Do you think that's a realistic assessment of the issues? Um. I'll start off with the second one because I think no, that's not uh, that's not a realistic assessment. Um, the the Chinese policymakers don't really have to care if foreign shareholders make money on Alibaba stock or not. <laughs> they really don't. Uh, it, amongst their list of concerns of their top ten concerns, it's probably number twenty five. Um, so it's it, you know so uh, no, I don't think that's my, my take is they have many many um, uh, concerns. You know, if you're a Chinese policymaker, whether foreign shareholders make money on equities, or, <laughs> no, that's that's not that's that's not that much of a concern. Um, I think what they do care about on the flip side, however, is they realize since Huawei and perhaps even since the 2008 crisis that remaining dependent on the US dollar makes no sense. Um, that basically having, you know, wanting to create your own, for lack of a better word, empire, um, you know, tying in all these other economies into your economic orbit uh, through the one belt, one road program, through the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, through the Silk Road Fund, um, you know, tying in all these um, uh, 
uh, all these other economies, whether you're you know, your Kazakhstan's, your your Pakistan's, your your Laos, your Cambodia's, your Burma's, you know, tying in all these economies and having all your trade with those guys denominated in U.S. dollars, so that American banks remain dependent. Sorry, so that Chinese companies remain dependent on American banks' willingness and ability to fund the trade. That makes no sense. So, to do that, you need to have a strong currency. You know, if you want to de-dollarize Asian trade, you need to have a strong renminbi, which is what they are doing. You know, one one of the uh, very interesting developments of the past couple of years is that the Chinese economy has been slowing. Um, it's you know, it's been the one economy where you've had disappointing growth. It's been the one economy where you've had um, disappointing uh, f- and falling asset prices, whether equities, whether real estate. Um, but against that, you've had a strong renminbi because that is now a policy goal. So whether equities go up or down, I don't think they care very much. Whether the renminbi goes up and down, they care deeply. Um, you know, we're, we're in basically the same thing as uh, we were in Europe in the 1990s, where you needed to have a strong currency to build the euro and give the euro credibility, et cetera. Um, now, to your point on, well, hold on, uh, you know, are we being hypocritical about Huawei when we look at, you know, the, I would say the, the very strong links between the U.S. military industrial complex, for lack of a better word, and the Microsofts and the Amazons of this world, et cetera. Um, I would say absolutely we're being hypocritical, uh, but, you know, that's the prerogative of power, right? It's you do as I say, don't do as I do. Um, and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're Chinese, you, you believe in Mao Zedong saying that, you know, power lies at the, the end of the barrel of the gun. And, um, and you know, today they're, the U.S. is the one who owns the guns. So, you know, the U.S. can have rules for itself and then impose other rules on other people because it has the world's reserve currency. It has the world's strongest military. Um, and, you know, and, and that's that. Now, if China doesn't like it, China could decide tomorrow, oh, nobody's allowed to use Microsoft. Uh, however, you know, that would be cutting your nose to spite your face, right? Um, so, you know, China has in essence decided, look, nobody's allowed to use Facebook and nobody's, nobody's allowed to use um, Microsoft, uh, sorry, um, Amazon, uh, and nobody's allowed to use Google, um, uh, which they've done. But uh, not using Microsoft is, that's too hard. In today's world, it's just too hard. And so, which incidentally, I think gives you a pegging order uh, as you look at the various fangs, which ones you should own and which one you shouldn't own. Well, China's decided we can't do without that one. We, we can do without Google. We can do, we can replicate sort of what Google does with Baidu. We can replicate what Amazon does with Alibaba. We can't replicate what Microsoft does. Uh, so it tells you that Microsoft is in a very unique situation. Uh, but, but Louis, Mark, Microsoft is in many ways uh, uh, symbolic of a much, much bigger issue. I mean, I hear voices in China warning against severe delinking from the capitalist order, for want of a better term, and, and they bundle, you know, European Union, Europe, and United States as one package in that context. And they argue that not only is it not geopolitically sensible, but also economically stupid for us to limit these guys is access to a market because for the last 40 years, they are the ones who really put China where it is. And even now, despite the tensions that we have, you know, China is still the largest recipient of direct foreign investment. You know, what is it? The tune of $160 billion, yep. if you include Hong Kong as well in there. So there are voices in Beijing, in Shanghai and elsewhere saying, you know, we can really take this too far and carve of ourselves such an auger that we will begin to hurt ourselves. And I'll be interested in your response to this one because I want to talk then about China's own structural problems on the economic front. So what do you say to, 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 to those voices? Do you think they have a point? Do they, do they is, is their uh, concerns being registered or do they feel like, you know what, our, our boat is sailing and, and get on or stay on land. I think that's, that's a, uh, I think you framed the question in, in, in precisely the right way in that 
uh, I think that is a, a genuine debate uh, in, in Beijing, um, whereby, uh, you know, are we a very strong and we can bully people to do our bidding, option one, or option two, we're actually not that strong. The US is out to get us uh, and we need to try to pick away um, people, um, you know, to sort of, and cajole people to sort of be more on our side, right? Um, and, and to be honest, I think that the pendulum in, in China seems to be going from one, one to the next and, and back again between these two positions. So for example, if you look at China's relationship with Australia, it's pretty obvious that here, China, to me, feels like it's overplayed its hands. Uh, you know, I think there was a feeling that we're China, we're Australia's biggest trade partner by far. Like we can, we can bully these guys into doing, you know, into basically not being a puppet of the United States for, for all intents and purposes. Um, and in so doing, they've really damaged that relationship. Uh, and that relationship is, uh, meanwhile, if you look at the relationship with Europe, uh, I think there's been a feeling of within Europe, maybe we can, uh, you know, follow sort of, the, frankly, the Putin roadmap of trying to pick, pick away various European components. So, you know, Europe may want to think of itself as one economic block, et cetera, but the reality is uh, you can pick individual nations. So let's, you know, do deals with Hungary. Let's do deals with Italy. Let's do deals with Greece. Um, let's do deals with Germany. Um, and let's make sure that, you know, we have strong allies, at least with, within Europe. And, and they do have actually strong allies within Europe. You know, Germany and Italy uh, are pretty strong pro-China voices. Uh, within within European institutions, uh, so are actually most Eastern European countries. Uh, the whole Weisgard group of Poland, etc. Um, I was I was once um, uh, having dinner with a, a, a Polish ambassador um, who highlighted to me that um, it was you know the whole One Belt One Road program was a, almost a godsend for Eastern European countries to, to, to the measure that, you know, if, you were, if you're a Poland, if you're a, um, a Czech, uh, Slovakia, any one of these guys, historically your lot in life has been to be squeezed between Russia and Germany. Uh, so you could either be Russia's puppet or you could be Germany's puppet. Uh, but in essence, you were never a full master of your destiny because you always had to pick one, one or the other. Um, and, and, you know, because you were a small country stuck between two behemoths, um, and that was your lot in life. Um, and now with China, all of a sudden, you, you know, with China putting in the rail links all the way to China, et cetera, you had another avenue where, you know, a third player you could play on that chessboard of saying, well, you know, because right now the big problem for the, all these Eastern European countries is to, to be in a situation whereby the, um, um, I'm sorry, I've got my dogs barking again. Um, the, um, the, the problem if you're one of these Eastern European countries is that you have a situation whereby if uh, you know, Germany says, don't do this, your only alternative is to go to Russia, which you know, doesn't, doesn't feel great. Um, so now it gives them freedom. Um, so, uh, and, so anyway, in this relationship with different people, or look at how, for example, how uh, you know, initially China tried to bully South Korea. If you go back 10 years ago, the relationship with South Korea was really bad. Um, it was trying to, to bully South Korea, et cetera. And then the relationship has improved uh, and it's improved quite dramatically. You know, China saw that, okay, that, that, was, that was a mistake. And here, I wanna make a quick point. Uh, when you look at China, I think we have to realize that um, really for 50 years, you know, being in the Chinese diplomatic service was not a top, top position because for 50 years, China was always looking inwards. Uh, China has only been looking outwards for the past 10 years. So it doesn't have, you know, if you go to France, if you go to Britain, being in the diplomatic service is very prestigious. Um, the, but it isn't in China or it wasn't, and, and now is becoming, but you don't build a diplomatic service overnight. You, you don't, right? It's, it's something that's built over generations. Um, China has 
in essence, only just started building a diplomatic service. And I think that's why you're getting mishaps and mistakes along the way. Louis, I want to give me, you... sorry, can you, can you give me just 10 seconds? I'm going to kick my dog out that's making too much noise. <laughs> give me 10 <laughs> seconds. Time. Sorry. Sorry about this. No, I, I, we know you, that you, you hug her. In with you, Louis. Louis, you know, we, we know that you hugged her and ushered her out and didn't kick her out in case any. Exactly. Uh, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> but, 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 but just to be back. But if now Europe is going to pump in 300 billion, you know, to get involved and compete with BRI. And now they have five focus areas energy, climate, health, digitalization, and transport. This is a Johnny come late, isn't it? I, I fear it is. Um, I fear it is. I think on look um, on the energy. Um, you know, for me, one of the, the the more interesting developments of of recent months was the Chinese Ministry of Energy publicly ordering Chinese SOEs to buy energy at whatever price, which was the the quote. Uh, now, I've been involved in market long enough to know that if you come into the market and you say I'm a buyer at whatever price, uh, you're not going to get the best price. Uh, typically, you're going to get your eyes gouged out. So, you know, you look at this, and I thought, okay, that's an odd thing for the Chinese ministry to say publicly to its SOEs. It's basically set them, setting them up for failure. Um, why would they do that? You know, they usually not, you know, this is a pretty dumb move. Uh, or at, at first glance, it seems like a dumb move, which, you know, they don't do that often. So, you know, maybe it's, maybe they just were stupid that one time, but it does happen. Um, but I think for me, the, the more likely explanation is they're looking at the energy equation around the world. And it's the old story of if you're going to panic, panic early or be the first to panic. Um, and they're looking at the energy situation and thinking, this is not looking good. We're entering into uh, an energy crisis in Europe. We're entering into an energy crisis in China. We're entering into an energy crisis in India, in Brazil, perhaps even in the US. And so, uh, yes, we need to, to stock up on energy. Um, so to your point, you know, Europe says, look, we're going to do this 300 billion thing, et cetera. A lot of that's going to go to green energy. Um, frankly, I would say it's a day late and, and a euro short. Uh, you know, that, that should have happened three, four years ago. Um, so we are entering into, in, into an energy squeeze. So you, could, you could also say better late than never. And that's also true. Um, it's the old story, you know, the, the, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The next best time is today. So Europe is choosing, let's do it today. Okay, fine. Um, but yes, to your point, when you put that in, in contrast to what China is doing, um, it does seem both late and frankly, not, not as big. Um, you know, the, the digitalization, I think here as well, what's fascinating to me is, um, you know, going back to this idea that five years ago, we lived in a world that was all integrating. And now we're living in a world that's sort of, you know, splitting apart. Um, I think this is very visible in the tech world. You know, if you look at the tech world, we're breaking apart, I would say, into three separate tech worlds. Uh, you, you have a Western tech world dominated by all the US behemoths that, you know, we all know the, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, and the, uh, the, the Microsofts. You have a Chinese tech world uh, in which the Chinese government has basically decided I need to, you know, have more control over what's happening here. So into the Alibaba's, the 10 cents, et cetera. And then you have a nascent India tech world where in essence, Modi, who is, you know, obviously a, a very nationalistic guy, uh, Modi who says, you know what, um, we need to control our own tech space. So we're gonna push out Facebook, we're gonna push out uh, Amazon, et cetera. And, and we're gonna build national champions. Um, in Europe, meanwhile, Europe is nowhere on the tech world. I mean, it's, it's, it, it really isn't. We have a few hardware companies like ASML and, um, and uh, Infineon. Um, but Louis, but, what I was but, saying is that they're gonna come and they wanna match and compete with BRI with this 300 billion. Yeah, yeah. That, that, is, that is, you know, it's just mind boggling for me. Well, it depends. So on this, I think, you know, I, and I, I think it's, it's gonna be very hard. Although, you know, the big question will be, okay, um, if this three, if this 300 billion is very earmarked, let's say to Eastern Europe to say, okay, 
China's trying to come in and basically pick off Eastern Europe from us, you know, the Hungaries, the Polands of this world. So let's make sure that doesn't happen. And, you know, we go to the Hungaries and we go to the Polands um, and we say, here's a bunch of money. Uh, then maybe, maybe that works. Having said that, you've noticed, I'm sure, that because all of a sudden they don't, they're no longer feeling squeezed between Germany and, and Russia for all intents and purposes, the Hungaries and the Polands of this world are increasingly, I don't want to be vulgar, but showing the European Union the finger. Um, they're increasingly saying, look, uh, uh, you know, we don't like the conditions that you're putting on us. Um, they're obviously feel, you know, no longer feel like they need to be under Brussels thumb. Um, so, you know, we'll maybe, you know, the increase of money that we would throw their way will change their minds. So like, okay, well, in these conditions, if you're going to throw more money my way, then I am fine being under your thumb. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, it's that 300 billion, I agree with you, is not so much, and it's definitely late in the day, which wow. incidentally to me is always, has always been Europe's problem. Uh, in all terms of policy making, is that whatever Europe does ends up being late and ends up because it's the result of compromise, it's the result of you know lots of back and forth, etc. Um, Europe is never on the front foot; it always ends up being on the back foot. Uh, uh, that's what comes with having to reconcile twenty-seven different no, no, absolutely. interests. Yeah, yeah, it's Eventually very hard. They, re they, re they reach some kind of agreement. But by the time they get there, of course, the goalposts have moved somewhere else. Well, Might either the goalposts have moved or the crisis has become so bad yeah. that, as we saw with the European crisis in 2012, 2013, it's become so bad that it's like, oh, well, now we have no choice. It's like yeah. we're so far down this hole that, OK, we have to do this. And, and again, uh, energy, any relations, energy relations with Russia is another good example of this, yep. um, where the, the European Union puts itself right against the wall and then yep. has very few options to proceed. But on the global, on the, on the, this global uh, network that EU has announced, my impression is that a lot of that money is gonna go beyond the union itself. And what China has said is, look, don't compete with us, work with us. But I just want to, to pick your brain on two issues. One is the digital, uh, you know, China's own, of course, digital Silk Road, is an enormous initiative in its own right. But first of all, if Europe has got you know, digitalization in its, in its sights, you know, we in Europe are as, as offended by the American penetration of our world as the Chinese are. So, so if we're rejecting the Americans for dominating our lives and we don't have work with the Chinese because we don't trust them, in all seriousness, what options does Europe really have? The other question I want to pick your brain on, Louis, is on, on you know, a green, green, green economy. Because, you know, there was a time that, you know, Europe was leading on green industries, whether it is solar, whether it is wind, whether it is nuclear indeed even, you know, the French nuclear industry has been a pioneer, um, for example. But, a lot of those technologies are now being developed, but also turned into products much more cheaply in China, right? So if this global gateway is wanting to create a green environment, it'll have to work with China to deliver on the ground. And yet if they want to respond to American concerns about, about China, then I see that the launch of this new initiative is nothing but trouble for them because they're again against the rock and the hard place. They're not gonna be able to, to appease United States and they're gonna see emerge from China real concerns about Europe becoming a competitor rather than a potential, potential ally in reshaping Eurasia. What are your thoughts on these? Um, so I think, uh, again, I love the way you frame the question. I, my, my first thought is as far as China's concern, the real rival, the one aiming to take China down is the United States, right? It's not, Europe hasn't been openly hostile to China in the way that the US has with, with Huawei, with the government declarations, et cetera. Europe has been far more ambivalent. So I think as far as 
uh, China is concerned, anything that Europe tries to do to sort of increase its independence from the United States is welcome, actually. It's, it's a good news. Even if that means it's also getting more independence from China, the fact that you know, the, the Western world would be sort of splitting is good news. You know, for China, the, the worst thing that could happen is Europe and the United States being super tight and being, you know, uh, um, like w as one. Um, and in that respect, I think China and Russia share a lot of the same foreign policy goals. You know, let's try to pull away Europe from, uh, from uh, the United States, even if it isn't that Europe comes on our side, even if just Europe just does, goes on its own side, that's a win. You know, that's, that's, uh, that, that, that's um, an advantage. Um, and yes, to, you know, to your point, um, I think one of the ways to, uh, one of the real challenges for, for Europe, um, you, and I don't have the answer, you asked me the question, I don't have the answer is, what does Europe do on the digital front? Uh, because indeed one option is to go with China, but that's, that's very problematic for a host of reasons. The other is to have all your data controlled by the US, um, which you could say is less problematic than having all your data controlled by China. And I fully agree with that. I'd rather have my data in the US than in China, but it still leaves you in a completely subservient position to the United States. You know, if you're, um, you know, if, if you're Siemens, how comfortable are you to have all your trade secrets on American servers um, where the NSA can come in and, you know, take, take a look uh, if, if and when they feel like it. Um, and, you know, I, I, earlier I said, you know, the, the U.S. took down Huawei. It'd be a little bit like if the U.S. took down uh, Airbus. Um, well, here's one thing. The U.S. took down Alstom for all intents and purposes. You know, Alstom. The, and this was, if, if we go back, you know, if you think of, you know, where does France have a comparative advantage? The aer aeronautical industry is one of them. Uh, the other one was definitely the nuclear industry. You know, this was a huge French comparative advantage that was sold on the cheap to the Americans by Emmanuel Macron when he was a banker at Rothschild, that he, he organized that deal, uh, to be very clear. Um, he organized that deal and Alstom, um, um, you know, was a massive loss of a French treasure for, for you know, it was sold for cents on the dollar to given all the money that the French government had put in to General Electric and it's now gone. Um, and yes, to, to your point, uh, you know, I think having an expertise in, in nuclear industry is gonna be extremely important for, for the coming decades. Um, when we look at, you know, the energy equation for, for, the, for the coming years. Um, and France has more or less lost that. You know, for, for France, when, when I was young, France had 90% of its electricity produced by nuclear. We're now down to 68%. We haven't built a new nuclear plant for years. Um, you know, a lot of them are gonna become obsolete in the next five years. Uh, it's, um, now Macron has turned around and said, oh, we're gonna do nuclear. He came in saying, we're, we're done with nuclear. <laughs> He's recently come out six months ago, I think looking at the en energy situation thing, okay, we're gonna go back to nuclear. But this isn't a thing where you just like, you know, switch your fingers and it's like, oh, let's do nuclear. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you might know the firm Le Creuset, you know, they they do all these fancy pots uh, and frying pans, etc. cetera. Um, they're the ones who were building the ceramic cubes for, for the French nuclear power plants. Uh, so Le Creuset really had two business doing these sort of super high-end ceramic um, cubes for the, for the nuclear and fan making fancy frying pans, um, they've lost the knowledge on how to make these cubes. Mm. They've lost knowledge because they haven't made any in 30 years. And you know, it, it, you've got to train workers who train the next workers, et cetera. So the workers retire. And then if you haven't trained the next mm. generation, that's, that's it, the knowledge is gone. Um, and, very interesting, Louis, very interesting. And, and yes, and, and a lot of that knowledge today, you know, China opens up two to three nuclear power plants a year. Um, so that knowledge is being built up in China that, you know, training those workers who can do that kind of work. Um, and yes, to your point, China today, uh, I think is becoming a leader in nuclear. Uh, I mean, there's basically three countries that have today that knowledge, the engineers and the workers, it's 
it's China, it's India, and it's Russia, um, because that's where the nuclear plants are being built. Um, and then solar, to your point, um, China is by now by far the world's biggest leader in solar. It is, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's owning that industry. So as we look to the energy situation in the future, think, okay, uh, what's, the, the, what's the energy of the future? Is it natural gas? In which case Russia and the United States have all the expertise. Is it um, nuclear? In which case Russia, China, India have the expertise. Is it solar? And then China has the expertise. Um, is it a combination of all? Most likely it's a combination of them all. Um, but Europe um, has done itself no favors in the past 15 years by, you know, sort of letting, you know, letting energy fall by the wayside. Um, and at the risk of being very long-winded, I think the reason we let it fall by the wayside is, is that if you look at 2000 to 2015, there was no energy demand growth in the Western world. Mm -hmm. Because over that period, what we did was we exported all the production of everything to China. So the world went from using 400 exajoules in 2000 to 500 exajoules in 2015, with 61 of that 100 increase coming from China. And out of that 61 of increase, 51 was coal. So basically what happened was we said, you know what, let's let China produce all the stuff we need and they can use cheap and dirty coal and pollute the hell out of their, their country. And as they pollute, we get cheap stuff. I mean, that was basically the trade. You know, China took on a lot of pollution and we got cheap consumer goods and we were very happy. In 2015, China says, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, not so much because of climate change, but because all my kids are dying of asthma. Um, and you know, I can't, I can't do this anymore. The world was safe because in 2015, boom, shell revolution. And so the next step up basic in energy consumption came from the US where you had very cheap cost of energy. And so during those 20 years where we basically, all the growth came from first Chinese coal, then US natural gas, Europe let energy fall by the wayside. It was like, oh, well, when we don't need the energy because we're gonna use Chinese coal, we're gonna use US natural gas. A generation later, we've lost the expertise, and and now you know what do we do next? Louis, I want to take the conversation a bit towards the Belt Road Initiative and the BRI, and a great deal of criticism on on the ballooning of debt and cost. And I couldn't help myself sitting in London, but to scratch my head. I remember this Hong Kong uh, Zhuhai Macau bridge that was built and you know opened. Uh, in 2009 for $1.5 billion. There is a bridge between Scotland and Northern Ireland as a result of Brexit that has gone from an estimation, listen to this, Louis, from 20 billion to 350 billion pounds. And I'm sitting here. <laughs> Louis, whether, listen, whether the bridge is built or not is irrelevant, okay? Yeah. But the fact that the bridge in a country that is known for its project management and engineering goes in 10 years from 15 billion to begin with. And, and by the way, the, the, bridge is, um, the bridge is 21 mil, uh, 21 miles, the one that has to be built. Anoush knows this, it's a pet project for Boris. The build that was built in between Macau and uh, Hong Kong was 30 miles. One and a half billion to 350 billion. That's the GDP of Iran. So your thoughts on what do you call on, on, on this notion of ballooning of the cost and debt? The second thing is that how big are you on some of these announcements of 400 billion dollars of investment over 20 years in the decoupling in an energy rich geography like Iran? And what where are these things going? So these two are my <laughs> questions to you i look I, I the belt and road is fascinating um my uh you know i think we're decently early on as a firm on it my, my colleague tom miller wrote wrote a book um called china's asian dream which i i strongly recommend i think the starting point we have to recognize is that uh, xi jinping is 
uh, an imperialist president. Um, and when I say imperialist, I don't mean that he's going to go and invade South Korea or Vietnam or, or anybody else, but that the history of every empire is first and foremost a road building exercise. You build roads to bring in commodities cheaper and to push out finished goods to the outer realm of the empires. That, that's why in Europe we see all roads lead to Rome. You know, that, that's what empires do, they, they build roads. Um, now for Xi Jinping in the 21st century, all roads don't lead to Rome, Rome they, they lead to Beijing. Um, and of course, that's what the One Belt, One Road is about. So now the reality, and this is true everywhere, it's true in France, it's true in, um, uh, you, you build roads, you put in high-speed trains, you put in uh, motorways, et cetera. You know, you might not make money off that. You know, the, this, the motorway might be a loss-making proposition. The, the, the high-speed rail may be a loss-making proposition, but you get externalities from, from that road that you get growth elsewhere. Like, uh, so it's, it's often hard to get accounting. Now, having said that, you know, a bridge that costs 350 billion pounds is gonna be very hard to get enough externalities to, 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 to justify. Um, but, you know, I, um, you know, I look at the, the rollout in the, the Chinese high-speed trains. You, you may remember this uh, from 10, 15 years ago when China rolled out its high-speed high train, the bearish argument was, oh, these trains are empty, uh, they're white elephants, nobody rides them. Um, and of course, five years later, you couldn't get a seat. You know, they were, they were all like uh, full all the time. And, you know, the few times I rode them, um, I, um, um, I once rode one from, Guang, uh, from Guangzhou to Wuhan, uh, which, you know, before would probably have taken 10 hours and now took about two and a half hours. Um, and what was interesting is talking to, to, to people on the train, you know, I met this one guy who was um, an entrepreneur who had 10 restaurants in Guangzhou. Uh, and, you know, he had a good business starting a bunch of different restaurants. Um, and he started restaurants in Wuhan and he would have not, he would not have done this if it was a 10 hour train journey, but with a two and a half hour train journey, you know, he could go in the morning, check on his restaurants, meet his staff, come back in the evening, no, no problems. Um, so you get all these sorts of externalities, you know, entrepreneurs who can go further, goods that move around. And of course, that's, that's, that's the, the big, uh, point of, of the one belt, one road, um, it's integrating a lot of economies uh, into, frankly, in, into, into China's economic orbit. Um, so yes, undeniably, some of these investments uh, aren't, gonna, aren't gonna deliver immediate positive returns. Um, but you know, if you're China, you're thinking, well, having you know, built the infrastructure in let's say Mozambique or Zambia and having access to the copper that comes from there, to the coal that comes from there, um, and having access to it on a reliable basis because the coal is now being brought by railway to a port that we now control where we ship straight to China. To us, that's worth it. Um, and, uh, and yes, I think, you know, the other thing we have to consider is the more China does this, the, the better it gets at, at building this infrastructure. Um, and here, I, I remember I, I was having a meeting in Hong Kong. Do you remember, I think it was something like, 12 years ago, maybe there were massive uh, storms in New York and the whole of downtown New York was flooded and, you know, it took a month to, to, to repair everything, et cetera. And I was having, um, and that very week, I had a very prominent China bear in my Hong Kong office um, who was telling me, you know, all these white elephants in Shanghai, you know, they're building all this infrastructure, but it's never gonna make any money. So that's gonna to lead to an implosion of the banking system, et cetera. And, you know, he gave me his whole bearish pitch for 15 minutes. And I said, yeah, but on the plus side, when it rains, their main cities don't get flooded. Um, and, and he was a bit stunned. Um, so all this to say that, you know, infrastructure costs a lot of money up front. Mm -hmm. um, there are tremendous externalities to these, to these infrastructures and, and getting that balance right isn't, isn't always easy. Um, but, you know, let me ask you this, you know, what countries went bust from building too much high-end infrastructure? You know, what country went bust from building motorways? What country went bust from building, um, uh, building uh, high-speed rails? 
Uh, now you could say, well, Greece did, you know, they took all this money from, from Europe, et cetera. But actually it, it wasn't really because of that, that Greece went bust. It wasn't because of the infrastructure. Uh, it was because of the, the excess domestic consumption. Um, so today, you know, China spends all this money on infrastructure, it's true. Um, but as it does, China continues to maintain very positive trade surpluses, very positive current account surpluses, which is, I think, where you have to start worrying. If you have a country that's spending a lot of money on infrastructure and at the same time running massive current account deficits, that means that there's a chance the country's leaning too far above its skis. China isn't there. You know, they're running massive trade surpluses, massive current account surpluses. They get all this money. They have two choices, really. Take that money, reinvest it in U.S. treasuries, get negative real returns of minus 3%. Take that money and invest it in emerging markets and, and tie in those emerging markets. Um, now, to Ali, to your point, the biggest opportunity of them all amidst all of this may not be Iran. Um, Iran is obviously you know, a, a, a big economy, lots of energy, um, lots of uh, young and qualified young people, you know, people who've gone to university, et cetera, uh, massively underutilized labor force, frankly. Um, now, Iran was sort of, an, it doesn't look like an island, but it almost was an island because on the one hand, you've got Afghanistan, you know, which sort of, it's, it's like having an ocean next to you because you can't really cross through there. Um, North, you know, you got Russia, so you're problematic. And then on, on the left side, you've got Arab countries that don't like you. Um, so now with the US having departed Afghanistan, you know, could we imagine the buildup of infrastructure that links China to Afghanistan through, uh, to Iran through Afghanistan? Um, now I know it would be a, an amazing engineering feat given the mountain terrain, et cetera, but we've done engineering feats before. We've built pipelines in, in Alaska. Imagine if pipelines could be built to go from China to Iran, mm -hmm. then, all of a sudden, nobody can put sanctions on Iran anymore. Uh, if you're Iran, all of a sudden you can pump your oil to China. And uh, obviously you wouldn't be able to sell it in US dollars. You'd have to sell it in renminbi. China say, yeah, I'll buy your oil, but I'll buy it in renminbi. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you're Iran, what do you do with these renminbi? Well, you have no choice but to buy consumption goods in China. So China you know, gets the Iranian oil and ships a bunch of sneakers and uh, medical equipment and, you know, whatever else to, uh, to Iran. So this, you know, the fall of Afghanistan is such a huge opportunity for China. It's, uh, and for Iran, and for Iran. Um, now, granted, for it to work, China will have to bribe the hell out of the, the Afghans in the middle. But this is where China has a freedom of movement that perhaps Western countries don't, is China's not above paying bribes. Um, which incidentally was always the problem of building roads, right? Which is, you know, you build roads, everybody's happy to have a road, <laughs> but then you got to protect the trade that goes on that road from, from looters, which often means you've got to put soldiers along the road and then that's when people get angry. Uh, or alternatively, you bribe the looters to not loot your stuff. Um, and I think that's what will happen in Afghanistan. Wow. China also has Pakistan, of course, as it's, as yes. a local minder, which, of course. which has confidence can, of both you, the Taliban and China. So you can bribe Pakistan more. to take care of it for you. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> that's true too. Well, listen, Louis, I think that there are two elements here. One is that this is our sixth dialogue of our kickoff, but one that definitely has to be 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. <laughs> So Anish and I have a lot to cover with you, but I think that we should bring it to an end. But I have a question that I always raise, and that is, what is your message to cinephobes and what is your most important message to cinephiles? That is my closing question. And before I hand it to Anush to wrap it up, your last name is Louis Gave, as many pronounce it. So I wanted to say thank you for giving so much and you really <laughs> gave to BRI Dialogue. So your most important advice to cinephobe and cinephiles, and we will definitely have you back in New Year, Louis. And thank you so much for joining. And that's it. And thank you for giving so much. Well, no, look, thanks, thanks again for having me. I would say I'd give the same advice to both. Um, 
it's always to try to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Um, and, you know, um, you, you, you know, if you put yourself in the other guy's shoes, you, you, you get to see, you know, what, uh, how the other person uh, looks, looks at the world. Um, and, you know, it's, if, if you put yourself in China's shoes, um, I think it's, it's hard to underestimate, you know, the pain and struggles that China went through for 100 years. The reality is, you know, basically, if you lived in China, frankly, from 1840 to 1975, it was the worst place in the world to live. Uh, you know, famines, civil wars, foreign invasions. Uh, it was it was a horrible. It was terrible. Um, you know, tens of millions of deaths, etc. Um, and uh, you know, that leaves scars. You know, deep deep, deep traumas. Uh, you know, so, something like the U.S. Civil War is still a trauma for the United States. That lasted four or five years, and and you know, killed uh, a million people. Um, you know, in Chinese history, that's peanuts. Like in, in, in terms of, of the pain, it's so, um, I think we, we always have to, to, to remember where people come from uh, to, to understand how their vision and how they, they look at, at things. Also, the amount of pain they can take. Um, and th this is the, the reality when I, whenever I look at China, whenever I look at Russia, these are countries and societies that have dealt with so much pain for a hundred years that we shouldn't underestimate how much pain they can take. Um, they can take a lot more than we in the Western world can. Sage, sage words coming from a young body, uh, Louis, very much so. Uh, That's absolutely, absolutely the case. I, 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 I've, got, I've got a ton of stuff that I, I want to, to explore further with you. Um, and obviously you're going to have to come back because actually we want to get into China itself. We want to get under China's own skin and talk about their economic model and what happens if they can't deliver on the projections that they have. How will that affect them? How th that will affect the world economy? How that will affect the BRI and all these dozens of countries which are not investing in BRI being their, their you know, kind of uh, insurance policy out of poverty and so on. But all of those things, hang them on the wall for now, because we hopefully good. we'll have you back to discuss those with you. You've been so generous with your time, with your expertise and ideas that we can't thank you enough, uh, Louis. I'm sure I'm that this is going to be very warmly received. And it's nice to see you smile after an hour of conversation, because hopefully that means you'll be back with us in the new, year, new course. Absolutely. Louis, Look forward to thank it. you so much. Thank you for giving so much. Thank you very much, Ali. Thanks, Anush. See you soon.